On Sunday nights, we're teaching on the book of Revelation. I guess this is as far as an overall book from front of it to end of it. I'm probably more familiar with all the verses of this book than any book that I teach on. I, I love this book. Most preachers can't find enough to fill up one night on it. They don't know what these things mean. And uh, I love this. And I've said this morning, I'm going to start trying to, every time I can, give you some point of fact before the message about the culture of the ancient world. There's a verse over here in Exodus, the 19th chapter. And uh, I'm going to read this. It's not particularly, you can connect it with the message we're going to talk about tonight. You can connect it with anything. In fact, you can connect any thought of the Bible with every other thought of the Bible when you teach through enough avenues. And God's talking about his deliverance of Israel, and God's going to deliver his church. We're talking about the second chapter of Revelation and how he's preaching in the second and third chapter to the seven churches at Asia. And, uh, and that is a deliverance. And he's talking about how he delivered Israel. And there's a specific verse here that has uh, an ancient culture of the ancient world. And not only that, it's a, it's a point of nature that God uses to show how he delivers us from our enemies. And I just want to show you this in chapter 19, verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone out of the land of Egypt, and of course they were being pursued by Pharaoh, and the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai. They come out of Egypt here. Here's Egypt right here. Here is the Mediterranean Sea. And Israel is right here on the, on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And you have Lebanon up here. That was the old land of Phoenicia or Tyre. And then you have Jordan here. Of course, let me kind of put it up here. You've got uh, Egypt down here. Israel here. Jordan here. And you've got... You've got uh, what we call Lebanon, that's Phoenicia, or the land of Tyre and Sidon. And you've got Israel coming out of Egypt. Yep. Israel coming out of Egypt, crossing the... They, they have been carried into... You remember the story of Joseph when he was sold by his 11 brothers. Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And he was sold by his brothers to uh, a caravan, an Ishmaelite caravan going into Egypt. And uh, uh, going into Egypt. And then they were there for 400 years. And they come out of Egypt. And God sent, takes them across this right Here's the Red Sea. Here's the, uh, that's the Sinai Peninsula. And he takes them out across the Red Sea. They come down here to Sinai, Mount Sinai. That's the Sinai Desert. And, of course, when they come out, that's the Passover. And 50 days after the Passover, what happens? What's 50 days after the Passover? Pentecost. Pentecost. The first Pentecost was when Moses got to Mount Sinai. It took them, it, it took them uh, actually about 10 days to get down there, but he was 40 days up on the mountain, and when he came down from the mountain, he had the Word of God. And in Acts 2, at 50 days after the Passover, the Word of God, or the Holy Spirit, which is the truth, and thy word is truth, was poured out on all flesh. So the first Pentecost of Israel, where they received the word, was 50 days after the Passover. That's where Pentecost comes from. Pent means five, and Pentecost means 50th. So 50 days, they're here, and that's what he's talking about, how God delivers in Pharaoh right here. And he, and he equates this 
with how he delivers young eagles. How in nature, the mother eagle delivers the, ba the baby eaglets. Now look here. And they departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai down here. And, and Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received the book of the law there. And were come to the desert of Sinai and pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel encamped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, And tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians... And what was it he did? Pharaoh's arm has got drowned. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. Ain't that great? He delivered them from the Egyptian armies. God has a way of delivering. I mean, when, when they went down into that Red Sea, it wasn't like the old Ten Commandments with a wall of water over here and a wall of water about 20 feet away over here. A guy being an idiot to go into that. God blew away... Besides that, it would have taken about six weeks for two and a half million people to walk through a 20-foot wide span. He probably blew it so far away when an east wind from the Lord came and opened it up. It was so far they couldn't see the water over here and far they couldn't see it here. And they took off down into the Red Sea because God made them go down across it as on dry land. He just dried it up. And they said, hey man, we got an open path to the to the uh, Israelites. But when they got down there in the middle of the Red Sea, and they're 10 miles, 15, 20 miles from shore, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an expanse about a mile long like it shows in the movies. No, it was miles over there. And they got down in the middle of it, and all of a sudden they see this water coming, and the way God saw to it to drown the... Egyptians, first of all, he gave them a stupid mind. After he did all that he did in Egypt, he made them stupid. Ba'ar, uh, dull of hearing. They couldn't understand. And the Bible says he pulled their wheels off their chariots while they were down there. And they drave them heavily, going, oh, get up, horse. And he wouldn't get up. When he compares this, he says in verse 4, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians... And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. The mother eaglet, the mother eagle, when she sees that the eaglets are about ready to fly and they look like they're bigger than her, she'll push them out of the nest. And they'll be flapping and flapping real hard and trying to learn to fly. And they just quite hadn't learned yet and they keep going down. And she'll swoop out there. And she'll take on that air current. And she'll go. Whoosh, and go down there and catch that baby. And carry him up to the nest. What a tender picture. That God rescues us. Like the mother eagle does. The eaglet. Isn't that great? I love that. And that's what he's talking about. He didn't just say this thing. I'll say something profound. That's exactly how the mother eagle rescues her babies. And God rescues the church. I'm going to give you one other thing, and then I'm going to get on to Revelation. The picture's on the hands. Look over here in Isaiah 49. Look at Isaiah 49. I'm, I'm going to start giving you a point of, just different points of uh, culture of the ancient world each time I get up. Unless I forget sometimes, I get to studying. But look here in Isaiah 49. I'll give you this. This is interesting. 49. Isaiah 49 and verse 16. Behold, this is the Lord talking to Israel... He says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Let me read to you something out of one of my culture books, Freeman's book on the culture and customs of the Jews. This is a figurative way of expressing that Jehovah will never forget Zion. 
The city is represented as graven in his hand so that its walls are perpetually in his sight. Thus the people of God who are figured by the city are kept in everlasting remembrance. It's like God tattoos us in his hands so he can see us. In fact, some of the writers tell us that when a Jewish son would go off to war, the mother would have some tattoo artist to grave her son's name or grave a likeness of him in the palm of her hands so she could look at her hand and say, there's my son. We have photographs today. Roberts says that a similar form of speech is frequently used in India to express one's destiny. It is common to say in reference to men or things, they are written on the palms of his hands. Remembrance of an absent one is exposed is expressed by a similar by figures similar to the one used in the latter part of the text. Ah, my friend, you have long since forgotten me, forgotten you, never, for your walls are ever before me. I see you, Israel. God has engraven the walls of Jerusalem, a figurative speech picturing a literal Israel in the palms of his hands. Many writers, however, suppose that there is in the text something more than an allusion to a mere figure of speech that an actual custom is referred to. It is thought that the Jews of that day were in the habit of tattooing on their arms or hands representations of the city or temple in order to keep before them something to remind them of the sacred places. This is Bishop Loth's view, and it is accepted by many commentators. We have an illus- illustration of it in modern times. Mundrell tells us that it was customary in his day for the pilgrims to Jerusalem to have figures of various kinds marked on their arms as memorials of their visit. And what we do is buy a T-shirt that says Florida, don't we? We still do something like that. These representations were called incense of Jerusalem. He describes the process as follows. The artists who undertake the operation do it in this manner. They have stamps in wood of any figure that you desire, which they first print off upon your arm with powder and charcoal, then taking two very fine needles tied close together, dipping them often like a pen in certain ink, Compounded, as I was informed, of gunpowder and ox gall, they make with them small punctures along the lines of the figure they have printed, and then washing the part in wine, conclude the work. These punctures they make with great quickness and dexterity, and with scarce any smart, seldom piercing so deep to draw the blood. First tattooing, and God says, I've tattooed you in the palms of my hands. Isn't that great? to know these things, and he bears us up with wings as eagles. I'm just, I'm going to kind of just pitch to you a a biblical cultural fact from the ancient world uh, as I teach to you. All right, we're, let's go back over here to Revelation. We are, we're in the second chapter. Let's back over here at least to Revelation, the first chapter. Everything in the book of Revelation was written to seven churches. Now, you've got sevens all over the Bible. Seven is the number of God's divine refinement. And you have a a Greek word for seven. I mean, a Hebrew word for seven. And this is a Jewish book. And God never changes his meanings from one end of the book to the other. And if he's talking about Jewish, Revelation is a Jewish book. I wish I had time to just go back and review all the Jewishness of it. First of all, you got seven candlesticks. You got 24 elders in Revelation, the the, uh, fourth chapter. And the 24 elders are the 24 sons of Ithamar and Eliezer. And that was a 24 course, uh, courses that they had. These are the 24 sons of Ithamar and Eleazar, the sons of Aaron. Aaron had four sons. Two of them were killed for offering strange fire. That was Nadab and Abihu who had left Eleazar and Ithamar. And all the high priests of Israel came out of Ithamar and Eleazar. 
And John the Baptist was out of the eighth course of Abiah. John the Baptist was the high priest of Israel. And Jesus was the king while he was here. It was not Herod. And it was not uh, Caiaphas. It was Jesus and John the Baptist. That was the high priest. John the Baptist. Jesus was the king. And, of course, the Herods couldn't have been kings. They were I do men. The Herods came from just south of the Dead Sea there, right under the Dead Sea. They, uh, that was the land of, of Idumea, or the descendants of Esau, Jacob's twin brother. And they didn't have any inheritance in Israel, but they had worked their way and been very wily with the, with the kings of, with the Caesars of Rome to get that position in Israel. So they weren't, during the days of Jesus, uh, Caiaphas was not the high priest. John the Baptist was technically. Now, of course, you have the word seven. Seven. Sheba. Sheba. We say Sheba. Queen of Sheba. Queen of Sheba means queen of seven. That word Sheba is the cardinal or the primary number. Number Seven. That's what it is. And from the same root, we get Shabbat. We get the word Shabuah, S-H-A-B-U-W-A-H. That is the word used in Daniel 9, 24, when God says, I, he says that I've determined 70 Shabuah. That word Shabuah is sevens, plural. Well, it comes from this word Shabbat, and that word Shabbat is one of the words for oath. And an oath is part of a contract or a testament. Testament is the word diatheke. And the, and, the, and the one who is going to be an inheritor of the contract had to participate, according to Jewish law, in the contract... And he had to sign, we have to sign the bottom line. And they had to sign the bottom line. And they had two witnesses to that. So you had the two contracting parties. And that was an oath. That was called, when they signed the contract, that was called an oath. Well, we have to take an oath. And that word Shabbat means to take an oath or it means two, seven, oneself to seven oneself or two complete and each time I think of the word complete I think of the word perfect or the word perfection and that does not mean to live without sin and be what we call perfect that's the word t-e-l-e-i-o-s it comes from T-E-L-E-I-O-T-E-S. Teleotes is perfection and our completion. And teleos means to complete. Well, Peter said, besides all this, 2 Peter 1 and 5, besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith, and then he names seven things that we have to add our, to our faith and that happens over many years. So we are sevened, completed, taking the oath to God. And these words are the exact same root. So to seven oneself is to take an oath to God and sign his contract. And he has to cause us to do that. You've got sevens all through the scriptures. The seventh day to rest. Jacob served seven years for Rachel. Jacob bows seven times approaching Esau. Pharaoh dreams, has seven well-favored kind and lean flesh and seven ears of corn, rank and good, seven ill-favored cattle. Uh, seven days they ate unleavened bread at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, seven lamps over in Exodus 25. That's the seven candlesticks. Seven days to make an atonement for an altar. Seven days of unleavened bread again in Exodus 34, 18. Uh, the priest 
whose sins were sprinkled with the blood of a bullock seven times before the veil. After Moses washes Aaron and his sons, he anointed all the priests in the tabernacle with oil seven times. Gosh, I've got a whole list of these. Uh, you had to be quarantined seven days if you had leprosy to find out whether it was contagious or not. Uh, all through the scriptures, the, on the tenth day of the seventh month was the day of atonement. The altar, the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled seven times. And God uses sevens from one end of the Bible to the other as a picture of completion. I don't have time to read all these. I've got so many. Uh, of course, uh, Naaman was told to dip seven times in the water. Uh, Job had seven sons. He had 7,000 sheep. Uh, gosh, I've got lists and lists of them. A just man falls seven times. A seven is an, uh, six things God hates, and seven is an abomination. That's complete evil. And all through the new, all through the book of, I'm not going to go through that. That's got so much of that, just pages and pages of it. And then, in, and then in the, then over here in Revelation, the first chapter. We see through Revelation, you've got seven candlesticks. I've got a list of all of them here. Revelation. Let me see if i got some of those. Yeah, here it is. In the book of Revelation, you've got seven heads uh, upon... Seven heads upon the beast, seven crowns upon the head, seven last plagues, seven golden vials, seven mountains on which the harlot sits in 17 and 9... Seven kings, uh, seven churches, seven spirits, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven candlesticks, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven thunders, and so on. Well, do you think seven, it still means the same thing as it meant in the Old Testament? Certainly, it's the same. It means completion. And you've got another number that means completion. And that is the number 10. 10. 10. Let me read this to you so you remember. It is also a divine number of completion. This is out of Bullinger's numbers of the Bible. It has been already pointed out that 10 is one of the perfect numbers. And it signifies the divine, the perfection of divine order. Commencing as it does an altogether new series of numbers. The first decade is the representative of the whole numeral system. What he's saying. One through ten is representative of ten through twenty. Twenty through thirty. A hundred through a thousand. In fact. A thousand is called a fat hundred in the ancient world. A hundred is called a fat ten. The first series is representative of all the rest, and that's what Mr. Bullinger says. Let me read this rest of this to you. The first decade, or the first ten, and of course, why do you say decade? Dec, dec is the word ten in the Greek. You remember... You remember when we talk about the word decomai? We say decade, that's 10 years. Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. Well, dec is the word 10. When the, and this is where we get the old, it's an old ancient saying. When the Bible says, 1 Corinthians two fourteen, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, because they're foolishness to him. And that word receiveth is dec. Oh, my. That's an old, ancient uh, cultural saying that means to reach out the ten fingers and accept an offer that's been given. That's why we say that men who are dead in their sin cannot accept spiritual things, the Bible says. The natural man, the sukikos man, the man who's dead in his sin, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him, neither can he know him because they're spiritually discerned. And that goes along with the tens. I'm going to give you this. 
What did I do with my tens? Here they are. Okay. Then he says, the first decade is representative of the whole numeral system and originates the system of calculation called decimals because the whole system of numeration consists of so many tens of which the first tens is a type of the whole. In other words, 1 through 10, or the number 10, represents every multiple of 10, 10 trillion. It's, it's a form. What he is saying is that 1,000 is a form of 10. 10 is actually a form of 1. And remember when we were talking about Kilia? Now, I didn't make this up. Kilia is the word thousand. Thousand years in Revelation 20. Thousand is the word Kilia. And I'm not going to go into teaching Kilia. But thousand does not mean, cannot mean thousand because Kilia begins... Uh, with Satan being bound, that's for, or being forbidden from deceiving a Gentile church, and it ends with a little season of Satan at the end of time, and it's already been 2,000 years. So we know that Kili is at least 2,000, and besides that, the old ancient Greeks did in their numeral system, they did not consider one a number. And any multiple of 10 was a form of the original number. So when you see Kilia being plural, they said one was not a number. It was a generator of numbers. They did not start counting till they got to two. So when you've got 1,000, it has to be 2,000 or more. Now let me give you some more on this tens here. Noah was the tenth from God, or from, uh, from God. Adam was the first son, and he was the tenth. Ten commandments, the Lord's prayer is completed in ten clauses. The tithe is a tenth. The redemption money was ten giras. The, uh, they had ten plagues that came upon Egypt. Abraham's faith, he had ten different trials. Ten nations imply the whole of the nations which are the scene of Abraham's covenant possession. Uh, ten rebellions in numbers. And then the silver sockets in the building of the tabernacle. They were ten times ten. Then you had fire coming down from heaven ten times in the Old Testament. Ten times the people shouted for joy in the Old Testament. Then you had ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. God's righteous curses are completed in a series of tens in the Old Testament. I have sinned. Ten persons complete the series of these uttered this, con this confession and acknowledged their desert of divine judgment the tabernacle is spoken of ten times as the tabernacle of witness or tabernacle of testimony. Ten words of Psalms 119, the tenth generation. He goes into that, the parable of the kingdom. The security of the saints is set forth in tenfold enumeration. And he gives you all the verses. Ten times Jesus said, I am. I am the bread of life. In John 6 and 35, I am the bread of life come down from heaven. In 6 and 41, I am the living bread. In 6 and 51, I am the light of the world. In 8 and 12, I am one that, I'm one that bear witness of myself. I am. 8 and 18, I am the door of the sheep. In 10, 7 and 9, I am the good shepherd. Uh, 10 and 14, I am the resurrection and the life. 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 14 and 6, I am the true vine. 15, 1 and 5. And he goes on. Words and phrases which occur 10 times. He gives a list of these. He's got so much on it. So 10 is another 
perfect number. Now, so 7 and 10 are perfect numbers. 7 is the number of the complete church, and 10 is a number, like he said, perfection of divine order. So 10s, and there's a reason I said that, because in the second church of Asia, uh, you've got a 10 there I've got to explain to you later. And I didn't want to wait till I got there. You have to have this in mind, just in case I don't say it tonight. That way, when I do say it, you'll know what it means. Okay? Now, the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does, what is that word revelation? That's not something that happens at the end of time. Most people think that is the second epiphany. But he talks all through this book. John said he's going to reveal himself to the seven churches. The book of Revelation was written to the seven churches. The seven churches of Asia are in Revelation 2 and 3. The in, in each one of these, he goes through seven churches and he writes a many, a many, he writes a many epistle. Epistle is an official letter that is dictated by the Holy Spirit to the church or to the saints of God for their correction, their instruction, so that they might begin to walk righteously. The, Paul wrote epistles. He wrote entire books to, uh, to, Rome, and, to Rome, to uh, second, first, to Corinthians, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. He wrote an epistles to Timothy when he was passing the church at, at Ephesus. He wrote to the Thessalonians. He wrote to Philemon. He, all these are official epistles dictated by the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about many epistles. When John, not John, when James in Acts 15 <coughs> sent the message in just a few verses in Acts 15... To, to tell the Gentiles in Antioch to observe these three, uh, these four things to abstain from uh, meat offered to idols, from fornication. And those two were coupled together because when they had these uh, idolatrous worship, all of the idolatrous Ashtaroth worship was a sex worship is what it was. And it, of course, it started in the garden when Adam looked at Eve and he got, she ate the fruit and then she gave to him and they saw that they were naked. They didn't know they were naked before that. When a man sees a good-looking woman naked and, and here's a handsome man, the only two on the earth, they took each other and when God came to them, in the garden, in the cool of the evening, he said, Adam, where art thou? He didn't mean, I don't know where you are. <laughs> That's not what he meant. You know, I'm hiding back behind this tree. No, he meant, where are you spiritually? And, he, and, and then God said, who told you about the tree? Now, most people think, who gave you the fruit? Who told you this? If the living God says, I want to know who gave you that fruit, you don't say, you don't say, I'm going to blame the woman. He answered God. Most preachers and a lot of scholars will say he was passing the buck. If the living God sticks his face in my face and says, who gave you that fruit? I'm going to say, she did. <laughs> and you're not passing the buck. You're scared of God. He wasn't passing the buck. She, she did it. I'm not blaming her, God, but and God's going to hold him responsible for his actions. Now, I got so many things here. Let's get back here to Revelation, the first chapter. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the word revelation, revelation is the word apocalypsis, A-P-O-K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. And... That word comes from apo, K-L-U-P-T-O. And apocalypto is the word revealed. 
And, of course, apocalypto is a composite of two syllables, apo and calypto. The, the word apo is a Greek word that means off with or to remove or to set off. And calypto means cover. It's just a common Greek word that means off with the cover. Now, God has already revealed himself to the church. And he's talking about write these letters to the seven churches of Asia. You've got some problems. Now, when he says Asia, he does not mean what we call Asia. What we call Asia is China and Japan and, and Indonesia and Laos and Cambodia. Laos, that's a good word there. That means people. We'll get into that too tonight. Laos, Cambodia, over here in India, we call that Asia. What they meant was Asia was the western end of Turkey. Turkey has probably got as much church history as any nation on the face of the earth. It's, uh, these were the seven, you had Ephesus right down here on the southwestern end of Turkey and right, right close to Ephesus, right off into the Aegean Sea, here's the Aegean Sea, you had the Isle of Patmos and that's where John wrote the book of Revelation in 96 AD. Well, John is writing to seven churches up here. Why would God only write to seven churches when there were a whole lot more than seven churches up here? God had to arrange their apostasy. He arranges everything, doesn't he? He had to arrange their apostasy in these seven churches. You had the church at Colossae right down here, and it was not one of the seven churches. You had the church of Milita just below Ephesus, and it wasn't one of the seven churches. You had the church of Troas up here in north, and it wasn't one of the seven churches. I believe God used the number seven to show this is a letter to the refined church as I refine them. And when he writes to these seven churches in the, seven, in the second, third chapter, he's telling the church what is wrong with them, and we can apply that to our lives. He's not just saying seven churches. He's saying to the refined church, that's how it's applicable to us. Well, when he writes it to the seven churches, let's look at it one more time. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, verse 1, chapter 1, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He's going to make the revelation, John's writing in 96 A.D., Things that shortly come to pass are 97 A.D., 98 A.D., 99, 150 years A.D., 1,000 A.D., and things that will come all along the way. That's when he's revealing himself to his refined church. That's what the seven churches are about. The seven churches also represent us, don't they? Sure they do. Now let's continue reading here. Shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. He signified by an angel. An angel kept coming to John and said, Come up hither, and I will show you things that are going to come to pass. And each time we see the angel saying, Come up hither, in the scriptures, what we're seeing is just simply John going up in a vision. In each one of these chapters, I've said this so many times, they're not sequential. They're not in a sequence. Sometimes you're looking at one chapter and you see, and you look at another chapter and you're just looking at, you're just simply looking, it's actually congruent or it's simultaneous happenings. You're looking in one chapter and you get this view and you're looking at another chapter and you're looking at some of the same time and you're looking at this view and it says it in different words. When you've got the earthquake in Revelation 6, Revelation 8, Revelation 11, Revelation 16, Revelation 18. It's the same earthquake. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a literal earthquake. There very well may be, which I believe there are. I believe the literal earthquakes is what Jesus is talking about when he says in Luke 21, 24, 
that there'll be signs of the sun and the moon of the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. And upon the earth, men's hearts will be failing them for fear, for looking after the things that are coming on the earth. Men will be disheartened. Their hearts will be sinking and having heart attacks too. Now, he says, Here's who the, here is who the letters are written to, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Well, let's tear this out of our Bible if it's only to the seven churches. The early church fathers knew that it was instruction for the church, us. And he's revealing himself. How many churches are there? One. And the churches are represented as the candlesticks, aren't they? How many... How many candlesticks do I have here? Oh, what makes them seven? Arms. It's one lamp. One church. The church is not local. They, the Baptists say, you got a local body of Christ over here in, in Hendersonville and a local body up here and a local body. And they believe the church is made up of a bunch of local bodies. No, the church is universal. That is the word Catholic. Whenever you, you'll see a lot of writers, they'll say, and the church Catholic or the Catholic Church, they do not mean the Roman Catholic Church. They mean the universal worldwide church, one church. Were these, were these different bodies that the seven churches were in? No, not so. Now, John to the seven churches or to the completed church or the church that's being completed, which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before the throne. And then we see, I'm going to read this again. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard of behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. It wasn't a trumpet. It was a voice that sounded like a trumpet. Someone with a powerful voice saying, and the reason it's powerful because if you'll notice, that's in red letters. That's Jesus speaking. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I said that the, the heads of those sun deities, when he was writing to these seven churches, one of the main deities there was the father of the gods was Attis. It's spelled sometimes A-T-E-S. What's amazing, that is the word tree in the Greek in the third chapter when Eve looked at the tree. That's the word tree, A-T-E-S. Makes me wonder if we makes me wonder if we got our word eight from that. A T E. And then you or Addis, or sometimes A T Y S, and it had variations of spellings. These father of the gods were called first and last. They were said to be Alpha and Omega. So when Jesus is writing this to the churches, what did we say about these communities this morning? We're talking about seven churches. Ephesus was the capital city of the entire province of that area. And at Ephesus, they worshipped Diana and the Ephesians. She was the Artemis of Asia. And the father of the gods, whether it was Attis in Pergamum, in the Pergamum Empire, or whether it is Zeus... In the, among the Greeks, or whether it's Jupiter, among the Romans, they were called the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Why is Jesus saying this? He's saying this as a correction so that the churches won't become involved with these idolatrous gods when they get out the door of their church because they're living in a land that's totally pagan. Now, and this is Jesus saying, I am an Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. Well, if it's only sent to the seven churches, I'll repeat, cut this out of your Bible. 
It's just to them. No, it's not just to them. It is to the refined church, and that's us. Which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now, each one of these churches has got some problems. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Isn't that Jewish? Seven candlesticks. That's Jewishness out of the 28th chapter of Exodus. That was the light of the tabernacle. The tabernacle, it was the only official light in the tabernacle. It was in the outer section of the tabernacle on the south side, the seven candlesticks, the table of showbread up here, altar of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant inside the veil. And only the high priest could go in there once a year on the 10th day of the seventh month. Now, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, in verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. When you get the explanation of these in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, here's the mystery. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Angel Angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. That word is that word angel is the common Greek word messenger. I wish we would just go through the Bible and everywhere you've got angel, just cross it out and put messenger. It doesn't mean necessarily a heavenly being. It can be a heavenly being. Michael is a messenger of God. He always brought the message of destruction. He was God's destroying angel. And Gabriel was a messenger of God. He is the one that came to Daniel uh, at the time of the evening sacrifice and oblation and gave the message to Daniel about the, about the 70 weeks. He's the one that went to Mary and told her, Blessed art thou among women. And blesses the fruit of thy womb. He is the one that announces to everyone. He is a messenger of God. But all the preachers of the churches were called angels. They were called angelos or messengers. A messenger is anyone who brings a message of any kind. I always think of angels as, as those, those messengers, those Western Union boys that rode those bicycles in World War II and they'd ride up to a house and take the letter up to the front porch and they'd say, they would say, we regret to inform you. They were messengers, but it was evil tidings. A messenger, an angel doesn't necessarily bring good tidings all the time. You got, you got messengers of good and you got angels that were messengers of evil that went to these people all through the scriptures. Now, now let's go. And he says, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Well, you go into a Baptist church and they get mad if you say that the church is Jewish. Well, let me just read this again. The seven candlesticks, which is Jewish, which thou sawest are the seven churches, which is Gentile. Those were Gentile churches, weren't they? They were in a Gentile land. They weren't Jewish. They were Gentile. It says right here that these Jewish candlesticks are Gentile seven churches. It, doesn't it say that? And we're Jews of the heart. We're circumcised of the heart. And boy, you go into a Baptist church and say, the Gentile church is a Jewish church. They'll, oh, that's not true. We don't believe that. And a bunch of thick heads. Their, their heads are made out of concrete. You can read that to them and they'll deny it. Now, Second chapter. Second and third chapter is talking about these churches and the problems they're having. I've already gone through some of this. I've gone through some of it. But I want to read back through this on Ephesus and read on down. I've got the piece of paper. I've misplaced it. Wait a minute. I'll have to thumb through here. Y'all have to forgive me. I can't preach without it. 
I'll find it here in a second. I got so many pieces of paper. I'll find it here. Well, got too much up here. All right. That's Balaam. I'm looking for my Nicolaitans. All right. Well, I got it here somewhere and I misplaced it. All right. Well, let's, let me get on here. All right. Let's look back here at, well, here it is, right there. Let's read here about the first church of Asia. Ephesus, southwest corner of Turkey. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Well, the seven stars are the seven angels, or the seven preachers, or pastors that he churches. And it applies to us because it's the refinement of us. What the preachers are, they're the light. They're preaching the truth. From their mouths comes the word of God, and that's the light. Light is equated with truth. The, the candlesticks are of no significance unless they have oil in them. And unless you light the oil and you project light, they're worth nothing. So the candlesticks, the angels, or the message is a picture of the oil inside the lamps lit up to give light to Israel inside that holy place there. It was the only official light in Israel other than when God came down out of the Shekinah glory. That was a light to the people. When God came down, that was a light of showing the judgment of God or his leadership. So you have a combination of the candlesticks and the oil inside. The oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit, and that's what's in the preacher is the Holy Spirit. Now, let's continue reading here. Seven stars in his right hand, which are the seven angels uh, from chapter 1, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, Ephesus, and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, there were many false teachers going around teaching false doctrine. And Ephesus had their hands full because that's the capital city of all of Asia. And I've said before, this is not a different Ephesus than Paul preached to. This is the same Ephesus of the book of Ephesians. This is the same, this is Paul's Ephesus. This is Timothy's Ephesus. Ephesus, why wouldn't they have problems? We talked about how that they faced down Paul in the 19th chapter of Acts when he was preaching there and accused him to trying to overthrow Dine of the Ephesians, their gods, and they had all kinds of workers that made these shrines, particularly one man named Alexander who was a preacher going to the church at Ephesus. And Alexander stood against Paul at Ephesus when they drove him into the theater and they were going to kill Paul. Well, Paul said, be thou aware of this preacher, Alexander. He stands with the enemy. Well, when you're going to study this book of Ephesus, I've said before, you have to study Ephesians. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Huh? Makes sense? <laughs> yeah. You got to study first. And second, Timothy. Because Timothy was the pastor. He was the angel of Ephesus. The, the messenger. He, during, the, during the time of Paul, he was the Ephesian pastor, church pastor. First and second Timothy and Titus, they are called pastoral, coming from pastor. Pastor, we get the word pasture from that, and that's a word that means a shepherd. We get the word pastor, pastoral epistles. Because this is where preachers are instructed 
how they ought to live in the church. And Titus is the pastor at Crete. Well, you've got to study Ephesians, First and Second Timothy, because Timothy is the pastor at Ephesus. And you have to study Acts 18, 19, and 20. Now, we've gone through 18 and 19, seeing all the problems that Paul went through and how they were trying to kill him. We go through all of this. Now, you have to study. We haven't covered uh, chapter 20, but let's read on down here. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. You might look here at, uh, at 2 Timothy. Let me show you here. 2 Timothy, a couple of men. Here's a couple of guys. Verse 13, 2 Timothy, Timothy pastoring at Ephesus. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good things which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwellest in us. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me of whom is Phygelus and Hermogenes. Let's write their words down. There's a, here's a couple of guys that say they're apostles and are not. Hermogenes, Phygelus, P-H-Y-G-E-L-L-U-S. P-H-Y-G-E-L-L-U-S. And then you've got H-E-R-M-O-G-E-N-E-S. M-O-G. Now, these are a couple of preachers. These are a couple of preachers that turned away from the truth. Who are some other preachers at Ephesus that Paul very well may be talking about? Huh? Yeah, Hymenaeus and Philetus. Look back. Look here in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy at Ephesus. At Ephesus. Here, 2 Timothy. Verse 15, chapter 2, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing, the word is ortho tomeo, ortho, or T-H-O, T-O-M-E-O. It means to make a straight cut. What it has the idea of, it has the idea of taking a sentence and diagramming it. Here's the subject, here's the verb, and here's the direct object, or here's the predicate nominative. And here's the, the words that to modify down here. It has the idea of parsing. Parse, a parsing guide, when I say a parsing guide... I mean an analytical lexicon. Parse means to divide. I'm not going to get all technical and say here's the direct object and there's the predicate nominative. I'm just going to stick that up there like that, okay? There's an English teacher and he was noticing that. I know that's the predicate nominative. That's the direct object. Uh, the first line goes straight through. The what? Line straight through. I, I, that was accident. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, thank you, Ing. I'll just call you Ing. That's for short, English teacher. Now, yeah, yeah, E.T., yeah. <laughs> we'll just call you E.T. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase the more ungodliness. I can take an hour and a half and teach on this, but I'm not going to. And their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. There's two young preachers. You reckon he might be talking about guys like this? H-Y-M. How do you spell Hymenaeus? I, I talk about them all the time, and I never do remember how to spell their names. H-Y-M-E-N. M-E-N-A-E-U-S. 
Hymenaeus, sin, P-H-I-L-E-T-U-S, Philetus. Now, there's some false teachers at Ephesus. Oh, there's another one. Let's go back over here to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. And this is at Ephesus. This is what John is having to deal with because Paul was dealing with it. John may very well may be talking about some other guys. Look here. Remember, First and Second Timothy, this is the pastor of the church at Ephesus, the same Ephesus as the first church that he writes to in Revelation, the second chapter. It's the first church of Asia. Now, look here. He says here in verse 19, chapter 1, 1 Timothy, still talking about Ephesus. Having faith and a good conscience. Boy, there you go, conscience. I, I can't get away from that, can you? Which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. They've shipwrecked the faith. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander? Alexander's a preacher there. He's the one that stood against Paul over there in the 19th chapter of Acts. Whom I have delivered unto Satan, an old ancient Greek term that meant to deliver to the, they would say deliver this man to the underworld, deliver him over into the underworld. This was a mystery religion's metaphor. It meant to execrate them or anathematize them or excommunicate is what it means. That they may learn not to blaspheme now. That they may learn not to blaspheme. He wouldn't say that they may learn not to blaspheme if they were vessels of wrath. He's saying these are preaching false doctrine. So you got Alexander. Look at 2 Timothy. Still concerning Ephesus. Look at 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. And people say, Jim Brown, you shouldn't call anybody's names. Tell Paul that. When I say Charles Stanley is lying, the Baptists are lying, the Pentecostals are lying, Kenneth Copeland's lying, and people say, you should never call names. <laughs> huh? What are you talking about? So people will know who they are. I'm not angry at them for lying to me because they're not going to fool me. I'm angry at them for lying to you if you're a baby believer and they lead you astray. Now look here in 4 of 2 Timothy... Paul says, while I was there at Ephesus, when they drove me into the theater in Acts the 19th chapter, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. He was a worker in the shrines of Diana, the female tree deity there, the Attis, uh, the Artemis of Ephesus. The Lord reward him according to his works. And he says, beware of him. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood my words. Now, I don't believe there's two Alexanders over there. When you got an Alexander in the 19th chapter that stood against him, and he says, he stood against me. You think this might be what John's talking about? They got all kinds of problems at Ephesus with preachers who say they're apostles and are not. Let's go back there to that, to Revelation, the second chapter. Huh? Well, yeah, Demas forsook him. I don't know that Demas... Demas may have been like a lot of other people. He he well, he did. He, he, he said he's loved this present world. He says, when you come over there in chapter 4, verse 10, he said, do thy diligence, in verse 9, to come to me shortly. And Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And he departed. Boy, when you think you're being persecuted and forsaken, look at Paul. Demas hath forsaken. And this is a time when the church was a baby infant church and there weren't many people around. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia and Titus unto Dalmatia. He didn't say Titus was, was forsaken him. He is just gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Now, Demas, we might put Demas in there temporarily. What I'm saying is whether John was talking about these same men, he was talking about some people like these men. 
that were saying they are apostles and are not because they were preaching false doctrine. Let me read some more of this. Only Luke is with me, and I love the next sentence. Verse 11, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. It was John Mark who wrote the book of Mark that forsook Paul and Barnabas when he went. He was a young kid going, okay, I'm ready to go preach. Okay, okay, let's go up there. Let's go up here and let's run down here to Cyprus. Got to Pamphylia. He said, I'm going home. I've had enough. And when they got back to Jerusalem, Paul said, Barnabas said, well, let me go get John Mark and we'll go on our next missionary journey. He says, Barnabas, he's not going to me. He's a kid and he's a quitter. But Paul restores him here. Paul is an old man. This is one of the last things that Paul wrote. Believe that he wrote this fourth chapter of 2 Timothy while he was in a Roman prison waiting to have his head cut off. And he says, it's time to restore John Mark to the ministry. Here is, this shows you how can God use a man John Mark was a real feisty young man. I'm going to win the world of Christ. And I get down here to Pamphylia. Well, I think I'll quit. And then later on, he writes the book of Mark. Supposed to be the first gospel written. Huh? Sound like, sound like me. Yeah, I did run off and act like a fool for a lot of years. Yeah, John, y'all can just start calling me John Mark. <laughs> Because I did that dumb thing too. And he says, take Mark and bring him. This is the first time Paul restores him since that 15th chapter of Acts when he said, he's not going with me. Isn't that something? For he is, yeah, amazing grace is true, isn't it? For his profitably for the ministry in Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchment. And he tells him, come before winter. Down here in verse 21, do thy diligence to come before winter because this coat, this cloak of verse 13 is the only one I've got. I need something to cover myself up with. Then they were not rich, look, regardless of what these guys said. Now, let's go back over to Revelation. All right. I know thy works, verse 2, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Was Hymenus and Philetus lying? They said the resurrection was past, and that word means it came into being one time in the past, and the word resurrection is anastasis. Anastasis means to come to life after dying, and we resurrect daily in Christ. Christ comes alive in us daily, and they preach this, I got saved one night doctrine, and Paul said that eats like a gangrene, a one-time resurrection. That's nothing but free will. Boy, they had their problems, didn't they? And has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, Ephesus, because thou hast left thy first love. He doesn't mean the first woman you loved. He, you've left your first. Agape is the word. You got two words, agape and phileo. And you have a, a profane or a common word, eros. And that's not in the scriptures, but this was a common word among the Greeks and the Jews. And all of these words in their world, we took all those three words and translated L-O-V-E. They're none of them the same word. How are you going to, tra- how are you going to translate the Greek, into the English. This word agape, that's the word, love your neighbor, love your enemy. A fellow walked up to me Wednesday night and said, how do you love your neighbor? How do you love your enemy? Well, it doesn't mean, well, this guy burnt my house down and killed my dog and killed my wife. And uh, I want to love you. Come here and let me love you. That's not what that means. I said, first of all, you got to know that the word is not phileo, 
because phileo means to have affection. God does not say, have affection for your enemy. That's not what it says. It says, agape your enemy. Agape your neighbor. God is agape. What is agape? A relationship that a king had with his subjects. The subjects had to the king. And they gave them laws to walk in. And they weren't so heavy that they couldn't walk in them. 2 John 6. Herein is agape that we walk after his commandments. There's an algebraic axiom. Things that are equal, the same thing, are equal to each other. Well, if agape is walking in his commandments and equals are substituted for equals, the results are equal, what we need to do is just insert this here, walking in his commandments, where we find the word agape in verse 4. Let's read it this way. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because they, thou hast left thy first walking in the commandments of God. They ceased to walk in God's commandments at Ephesus. They were still a Christian church. But they had a bunch of false teachers from the previous verse. <sighs> Something else, isn't it? Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. Metanoia, be turned and he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to a believing church who are not really keeping the commandments of God anymore and walking in righteousness. What are we talking about here? The first church that this book was written to, the seven churches of Asia, aren't we? Do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick. I like the way, I think Victor said it the other night. I'll remove your preacher. He doesn't mean I'm going to take the candlestick away. The candlestick is the church. If you remove the candlestick, the only important thing about the candlestick is that the candlestick and the oil in it produces the light, the truth. I'll remove your truth. He doesn't mean I'm going to rip that candlestick away and throw it into hell. That's not what he's talking about. I'll remove your... And it's not candlestick, it's menorah, lamp. The reason this was written candlestick was when the King James Bible was translated in 1611, wax candlesticks, they hadn't been invented back here. This word, word is lamp. That was the method in the 1600s of lighting streets when they'd, you'd see, there's the old the song, The Old Lamp Lighter, they'd go down the street and they'd light those candlesticks inside those little glass uh, basins. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Now he's writing to the seven churches because of some lackadaisical attitude in their lives or something they're partaking in. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I want to give you the Nicolaitans. I, what it, boy, this has been one of the big questions. What is this talking about? I need to take you back before I get to the Nicolaitans. There's a chapter I didn't cover last week. If you're going to study, you have to study Ephesians, 1 and 2 Timothy. You have to study Acts 18, 19, and 20. Now, we've said that Paul was converted on the Damascus Road. Well, he was, when, when Stephen was stoned in the seventh chapter, at the end of the seventh chapter, of Acts, Paul was over there holding the coats of these that were stoning Stephen, the first martyr of the church, one of the first seven deacons in the sixth chapter. Deacon is the word diakonos, D-I-A-K-O-N-O-S. It means a household slave that waits on tables. A deacon is not somebody that hires and fires the preacher and sets the salary. Says you got to slow. You're going to have to cut your messages down to 30 minutes. We want to get home and eat and watch the football game. That's what deacons are for. They wait on tables. And what do they serve? It's one of the words for minister. 
They serve the nomos. Nomos is the word law. It means legal food. That's what they serve. I've got to go back and touch chapter 20. I've covered, let's go back there. Acts 20. Last week we covered 18 and 19. Whenever you're studying one of Paul's epistles or one of Peter's epistles or John's epistles, what you need to do when you're studying Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Titus, Philemon, and everything that Paul wrote, or if you're studying 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, John, or 1st and 2nd Peter, what you do These men are writing to these churches where they've traveled all over the world. That's what their epistles are, their letters, back to these people, correcting them, telling them how to live, and hearing words from messengers coming to where they are after Paul would go on a journey up here and he would leave Philippi up here and he'd go down here to Athens or then come down to Corinth. He'd be writing letters back up to Philippi and writing letters over here to to some church at Corinth if he's somewhere else that's what the Bible is about and all of the things that they write about you're going to find most of what they're writing about in the book of Acts what you do when you're when you are what you do when you go to Romans you look at Paul's references to Rome when you're when you're talking about uh, Corinthians you you go into the script you go into your interlinear you go into your concordance and you look up Corinth if you don't know where Galatia is it's mentioned in acts but you have to understand that Galatia was Paul's first missionary journey in acts 13 and 14 he went to these cities right here Antioch then Iconium Derbe and Lystra a Lister and Derby, and they stoned him and left him dead, left him for dead outside of Lystra in the 14th chapter of Acts. What you do when you're studying the epistles, take your concordance, learn where these places are, and if you and if you don't have a set of McClinic and Strong, get a set or get some good set of, of biblical encyclopedias where you can look up these cities, look up these books, and find out where these cities are and where they were written to. Now, I'll give it to you on the tapes, but it's good for you to check out to see if what I'm saying is true. Be a good Berean and check it out. Now, where did I say we're going to go? Okay, let's go back over here to Acts. We know that Paul... Let me erase some of this. We know that Paul was converted... He was making havoc of the church. Let me race this. And I can't teach these, these, what these are. When you see him writing to Ephesus here in the first part of the second chapter, that is a mini epistle. It's a, a small few verses epistle just to Ephesus. Each one of these letters that he's writing... Two, it goes to one of the churches, and the second church there is Smyrna. That comes from the word myrrh. Myrrh was a sweet-smelling ointment that they used to put on the bodies because they didn't embalm them, and they got to stinking. And uh, Smyrna is the second church. Pergamos is the third church. Thyra, uh, Tyre is the fourth church, and that takes you down to Sardis, uh, the fifth church there in in uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And the sixth church is Philadelphia in verse 7 of chapter 3. 
And then that takes you down to Laodicea in verse 14 of chapter 3. These are all many epistles, these few verses that he gives. These are equivalent to Paul writing the book of Galatians. These are equivalent to Paul writing the book of Corinthians to the Corinth to correct them and instruct them how they ought to live. That's what these are. And they were having problems. Now, let's go back over here. If you're going to study this church of Ephesus, you have to go back and see Paul's problems. Now, Paul, in Acts, the seventh chapter, seventh chapter, we, he was consenting to Stephen's death, and, and Stephen was preaching to the Sanhedrin, rebuking them and saying, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in ear and heart, you bunch of lying Pharisees, you do always resist the truth. And they gritted their teeth and started spitting and said, we're going to kill you, Stephen. And they did. And Paul was holding the coats of the men that were stoning him. And then when you get to Acts, the ninth chapter. And of course, Acts, the eighth chapter, excuse me, Acts eight. Paul is spewing out cursings, dragging the people from all over the world that are that are. Christians, take him to Jerusalem and slaughtering them. Paul was a murderer of Christians. That's what he did for a living. People come to me and say, you just don't know the sin I committed. I've, I've been on drugs and I was a drug dealer. Have you ever killed several hundred Christians? Murdered them. When Paul said, I am the chiefest of sinners, how else would you feel when, how else would you feel when you've murdered some of the most righteous men in the world and then God strikes you down on the Damascus Road at the first part of Acts 2 of Acts 9 the scripture says that Paul was making havoc of the church slaughtering them has anybody here done that no ain't nobody here mean as Paul was he was a mass murderer and he became the greatest. Well, I just think of Timothy being stoned. And he looks up over there in the corner of his eye and he sees this Paul consenting to his death. Stephen. Oh, Stephen was being stoned and Paul looks over there and Stephen looks over at Paul. I just wonder what Stephen would have thought when he's saying, here's one of the great butchers of the church and he's going to be the greatest of all the church saints in New Testament Scripture. Boy, that is amazing grace, isn't it? Well, yeah, three days later, he's preaching enough to make the Pharisees mad and they want to kill him three days later after he's been slaughtering the church. Boy, that's, is that predestination? I mean, when God struck him down on the Damascus Road at Acts 9, whew, forevermore, he begins his ministry in Acts 13. That's where he begins his ministry. In Acts 14, this is Paul's first missionary journey to a little state up here in upper, what we call Turkey, right in the center there. And these cities, Antioch, uh, Iconium, Derby, and Lystra and Derby, when you look those cities up, that's who he's talking to in the book of Galatians. Well, he starts his first journeys here. And what we're talking about is when he goes to Ephesus, over here in the 18th chapter, he goes to Ephesus, stays there two years. He's persecuted, run out of town. And then he, confront, he has the confrontation with Alexander in the 19th chapter. You see... The certain man named Demetrius, the silversmith, in verse 24, who, which made silver shrines for Diana, the tree goddess, the moon goddess, the, uh, the equivalent to Venus. And these were all the Ashtaroth, the tree deities. And that's where the Christmas tree comes from. It's the worship of these deities. They brought no small gain to the craftsmen, and they start accusing Paul of trying to destroy all of their, uh, their profit-making business, making shrines to Diana. 
at Alexandria is drawn out of the crowd in verse 33, and he withstands Paul here at Ephesus. Now, I want to show you something else connecting this. Uh, Paul is coming back on this journey, and he goes to Miletus in verse 17 of chapter 20. Here's Ephesus. I've already covered last week. If you didn't hear it, get the tape. And I cover 18 and 19. And then in 20, let's just read some of this to give a little more foundation. Paul is coming in from a missionary journey. And he comes from Macedonia in Greece and Corinth. And he's coming back on his way back to Jerusalem. Here in the 20th chapter, he's going back to Jerusalem. He's coming back over through here, and he doesn't go to Ephesus. Evidently, he's having a lot of opposition at Ephesus. And here in verse 17, and from Miletus, that's just down below Ephesus. About 20 miles down below Ephesus, Paul calls the elders of Ephesus to come down and meet him at the church at Miletus. And that's not mentioned, and it's one of the, it's in Asia. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he's still instructing the Ephesian people. You need to study all these things on Ephesus to understand Ephesians and 1st and 2nd Timothy and the second chapter of Revelation concerning Ephesus. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know that from the first day that I came into Asia, of course, Ephesus was in what they called Asia, Asia Minor, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations. Temptation doesn't mean he was looking at naked women. But I want to go on temptation. Every time you find it in the New Testament Scripture, it is the word P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S. Every time you find the word temptation, it's this word. This word is the same word as trial or try. Same exact word when Peter said in, in 1 Peter 4 and 12, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. It means to be put in a fire. He said, You have heard how that with many tears and many trials of temptations, many fiery trials and men persecuting me, me running for my life which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Who was trying to kill Paul? The most religious men of the day. It wasn't pagans. The pagans didn't bother him. When he went to Mars Hill at Athens, and he went out there, and they all had a philosophy, and and they had to... And he went to Mars Hill, and he said, he said, let me tell you about... He saw they had statues, and they had idols to all their gods, and they had one said, we don't want to miss any to the unknown God. And Paul said, I want to talk to you about this unknown God that you don't know. And Paul preached to him. And he said, I perceive in all things you're too superstitious. And they didn't even get mad at that. The word superstitious, you remember that word? What was it? D.C. D.C. Diamonesteros. D.C. D.E.I.S.I. D-A-I-M-O-N-E-S-T-E-R-O-S. That's Larry's favorite word. Larry loves that word. He said, I like it. Dici Diamonestros. It comes from the word Delia, D-E-L-E-I-A. That's the same word that Paul used when he tells Timothy, God hasn't given us the spirit of fear Doesn't mean you're not to fear God. He was talking about timidness towards men. It has the idea of fearing men. And it comes from Delia and D-A-I-M-O-N. Damon means to distribute fortunes. 
fortunes and the sun gods that were started at Babel in Genesis 11, all of these sun gods and moon goddesses and gods in the stars, whether it's Hercules, a demon was a god-man that could distribute fortunes. Well, Hercules went on his 12 labors and was supposed to distribute fortunes to the peoples of Greece back in the ancient world. And then you had Perseus. He was the equivalent of Hercules there in Joppa and uh, in the land of Argus. And then you had the, all of these gods. These were called demons. Demon and the word theos were interchangeable in the first century. Theos is the Greek word God. And it means a magistrate or a judge. When you said demon, daemon, or theos, you had to stipulate who you were talking about. They said Hercules was a demon or a daemon. And what Paul tells them at Mars Hill, he said, you have a fear of the gods. That's what's wrong with most people who go to these churches. Some guy listened to me and said, Jim Brown, that's a really good message. That's really interesting stuff. And, I, and I'll tell people, then what do you go to that Baptist church for? He's a liar. He don't tell the truth. He talks about accept Christ. He's got his Christ mask, got his water, his crackers and grape juice. He don't believe in fiery trials. He don't believe in persecution. And what it is, they're trying to latch on to all the gods that can distribute the fortunes of heaven to them. Well, I'll believe Jim Brown and I'll hold on to Billy Graham and I'll hold on to the Pope and I'll hold on and I'll hold on to all my gods and that way one of them will get me saved. But when you hold on to all of them, you don't believe in any of them. You certainly don't believe in truth because God says, I will have no other gods before me. You can't believe in the other gods in this one too and that's what they meant. Now, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. He said, I went through tears and temptations in verse 19, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. Remember, Paul is at Miletus, and he calls the elders of Ephesus down to Miletus. So he's preaching to an Ephesian elders in the church. So this is a message to Ephesus right here. And now how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but taught you publicly from house to house when I was in Ephesus, testifying both to the Jews and all to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem. He said, I have to go not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. There's the persecution of Paul. When we are predestined to conform to the image of Christ, to his likeness, here's what we're predestined to conform to. But none of these things move me. Boy, I like that. None of these things move me Neither count I my life dear unto myself. That's what you and I were talking about, Don. I believe it's you or Dion or Dennis and one of y'all, all of you. You have to come to a place where you don't count your life dear anymore and you get fed up with the outer man. Fed up with self. So that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, talking to Ephesian elders, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, you're not going to see me anymore. I know it's not going to happen. What he's saying is I'm leaving here. You'll never see me at Ephesus again. I'm going to Jerusalem to be bound carried to Rome, and executed. He knew what his future held. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you 
all the counsel of God. Did he tell all the counsel of God to the Ephesians? How about the first chapter? Look at it. People don't like the first chapter of Ephesians, do they? Here's the men he was talking to. I haven't shunned first chapter. I never heard a preacher other than somebody who believes in predestination. Never heard the first chapter of Ephesians read in my life from a Baptist pulpit. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. I have not shunned to tell you anything. I'm not an apostle by my will. It's by the will of God. I was saved by the will of God. I was quickened by the will of God. He says, I don't shun to tell the Ephesians anything. I believe that's why this book is so hard, on pre- and it's a predestination book. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4, Ephesians 1. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. People say, why would God do that? According to the good pleasure of his will, he wanted to. Why was he sent certain men to hell? He wants to. Why would he just take only certain ones and a few to heaven? That's according to the good pleasure of his will. When somebody asks you why God would do that, tell them, that's what he wants to do. Who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Job 33, 13. Was thou, why dost thou strive against thy maker? He giveth not account of any of his matters to you. Job. That was Elihu rebuking Job. Why are you striving with God? He's not going to account to you. And that's what these preachers think he's going to do. According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We don't accept him. He makes us accepted. Boy, I like that. I believe this is exactly what Paul's talking about when he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. This is their first love. This is when they, at their first love was, boy, they were on fire when Paul first came. But by the time John is writing Revelation and Paul is long dead, they have departed from the faith. They've left their first love. Let me get me a, I've got junk all over me. Won't y'all just say, mouth. All right. Now, where am I? In whom also we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Huh? Yeah, through his blood. Not dipped in water. That's right. Blood baptism. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us, believers, the mystery of... Of his will according to his good pleasure. Not my pleasure, not your pleasure. Don't matter whether you and I like it or not. This is the full counsel of his will. And Paul said, I haven't shunned to preach this to you. It's the same Ephesus of Revelation, that second chapter. The first church of Asia. Do you think all of these problems went away from Ephesus just because Paul is going and John is writing to him? No. No. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. One body, one church. And he only died for his church. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Even in him in whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. I never heard those words read in my entire life until I was grown. And my father was a Baptist preacher, and I heard hundreds of Baptist preachers by the time I was 20. We went to all kinds of fellowship meetings, and I heard them by the dozens. I never heard those words read. And when he says over in the fifth chapter, speaks of the washing of, of the church, 
Husbands, love your wives, verse 25, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That shouldn't be it. It's the word autes, A-U-T-E-S. That is, we got our word auto. It is feminine gender with the ada there. It's her. He only died for his church. That's not shunning to tell people. He didn't die for the man in hell. And he didn't die for vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. He died for her. Nobody else is going. That's the full counsel of his will, isn't it? Look, up, look back over here what he says. We're studying Revelation. But we've got to go back and cover Ephesus, don't we? Let's read that verse again. I, these two verses go together here. When he says in verse 20 and verse 27, you ought to draw a line between the two. Acts 20. We're still talking about Ephesus. And I can't teach Revelation. Where's a pen? I'm going to show you what I do. Here you go. You take a pen. And you take... Here's... Verse 20, verse 27, I'll draw a line from here down to there. Because he says in verse 20, I have kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Can you say that about the book of Ephesians? When he's talking about predestination, talking about God died, that Jesus died for his wife and nobody else. Verse 20, for I have not shunned. To declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now watch what he says when I'm gone. This could be pointing towards John after he's gone. These next verses here. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock at Ephesus. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. Which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. The most devastating thing to a flock of sheep is a pack of wolves. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So when you get to these grievous wolves, after Paul is gone, he said, when I'm gone, John is having problems with these grievous wolves. And what are wolves? According to the seventh chapter of Matthew. They're false teachers. A wolf in sheep's clothing is a false shepherd. The shepherds wore wool coats. And the false teacher comes, according to Matthew 7, dressed in sheep's clothing. It doesn't mean a literal wolf's snout and he's got on a, looking like a sheep. That's not what it means. It means he comes looking like a shepherd. He looks like a pastor. He looks like a preacher. He walks like a preacher. He uses all this terminology. It's like the writers that you read after when you read uh, these customs of Scripture. Fred White is one. When you read uh, Shepherds, look at the 23rd Psalm by Philip Keller. He was a shepherd. and He said the most devastating to a thing to a flock. He said wolves will come in. A flock of wolves. Uh, a pack of wolves will come into the flock and they'll kill every sheep in the flock. And in the morning, there'll be a hundred sheep out there dead. The whole flock is dead. If a lion comes in, it'll take one sheep and go and eat it. If a bear comes in, it'll take a sheep or two. But false teachers are equated with wolves. Now, wolves, wolves don't kill people, but they love the stock of these cattlemen out in Wyoming. That's why they don't want those wolves coming in there. They will just for the fun of it go in and kill all the flock. And Paul says, after I'm dead, John's going to write you a letter that grievous wolves have come in and they say they're apostles and are not. 
It's not a matter of whether they are Hymenes and Philetus and Phygelus and Hermogenes and Alexander or Demas. It matters that this continual apostasy is is going to continue. Do I have any time? I'm just getting started. I've got to go back. Th- I've got to go through these churches. I've got to stand these epistles. I'll go through the Nicolaitans next week. And the doctor of the Nicolaitans. I'll get back to, I'll get to Smyrna and Pergamos. But you cannot study Revelation without studying these churches and finding out the problem with the churches because the refined church is when the church gets itself right, but they don't do that without God causing it to happen. That's predestination. And we're going to look at all the problems that each one of these churches has. And this is a picture of the church at large, of the church being refined. That's what the word seven means. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for truth. Cause us to continue this work. And God, give me strength to preach the word and unravel this scripture, Lord, we may see it. God, teach me to slow down and take time and exegete your word and pull it out word by word and culture by culture and that we may see how God is refining, how you're refining us and completing us. Thank you for truth. We praise you for it. And God will give you praise for all things. In Christ's name, amen.